Our second speaker is an assistant professor of political science at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. He is also a fellow of the Social Weather Stations and he was a speaker of the 15th Jaime V. Ong Ping Annual uh, Memorial Lecture on Public Service and Business and Government delivered in 2016 here at Ateneo Professional Schools where he gave a lecture critical of the federalism project of the Duterte administration. Among the courses he teaches in UP is a course on institutional design, uh, institutional design literature in political science. He also teaches a course on the current federalism project in the Philippines in the same university. Since 2016, Professor Pilapin has delivered a number of lectures critical of the Duterte's, uh, Duterte administration's federalism project to a diverse audience of students, parishioners, urban poor community members, fellow teachers, civil society activists, businessmen, and officers of a major international development agency. This year, he has prepared twice as a resource person in the Senate, here, uh, in the Senate hearings on charter change and federalism. On both occasions, his critical statements were well covered by media and provoked widespread public discussion, including reactions from Malahanya. My dear friends and colleagues, please welcome Professor Jean Kilapi. Going to, um, the title of my lecture for today is The Federalism Project of the Duterte Administration, a critique using the institutional design literature uh, in my discipline, political science. Uh, this lecture is part of my ongoing research project entitled A Critical Review of the Federalism Project of the Duterte Administration, funded by the Office of the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Diliman to the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Development's Outside Research Camp. Uh, but first, some acknowledgments. I would like to thank Mr. Javan Oliver and Ateneo Graduate School of Business Student Council. Um, I got your logo from your Facebook page. Very nice logo. For inviting me to speak in your forum on federalism. Thank you. Um, I have three main aims for my lecture. First, assert the importance of the institutional design literature in political science, the very literature that specializes on the design and redesign of political institutions in assessing the Duterte administration federalism project and its broader constitutional overall campaign. Second, give three of the many cautionary insights available from the institutional design literature when attempting constitutional overhauls, especially when involving democratic regimes. This is something we would emphasize, democratic regimes are special subsets okay, of countries. Apply, er, apply discussionary insights to the Duterte Administration's federalism project and its broader constitutional overall campaign. Outline of the lecture. We start with a short introduction to the institutional design literature. Second, precautionary insights from the institutional design literature applied to the Duterte administration's federalism project and its overall charter change campaign. The lecture runs for about 16 minutes. For those who are interested for a longer okay, treatment of the lecture, including uh, the citation, a more complete citation of the scholarship use. If I may advertise my YouTube page, okay. um, it's Prof. B. 
There's not to get lectured there that runs for close to three minutes. And you might notice that uh, two lectures there are in Filipino. And I've been fortunate enough to lecture one, a Filipino lecture, uh, in front of an urban pool community. Let's have a short introduction. When we say institutional design, this would be differences in the arrangement of formal tools. For example, one basic example is form of government. In my discipline, when you say form of government, it is actually a technical term. When you say form of government, this is the relation between the executive and the legislative. And we take this relation as a horizontal relation because they're supposed to be co-equal to each other, the executive and legislative. The institutional design of a country's form of government, therefore, is separated, is presidential, if you both separately, okay, the president and the legislative, and then separate powers, we call it presidential, is fused, parliamentary, and is hybrid, semi-presidential. You have a semi-presidential form of government if the president is directly elected, and you have a prime minister also elected by a parliament. Another basic example okay, is the system of government. And this is something that we're going to discuss okay, a lot today. When you say system of government, this is the relationship between the central government and the local government. And we depict this relation as a vertical one because there's a clear hierarchy in both. If it is a unitary system of government, okay, the central government is the single central source of authority. It is the one that makes final decision. And this framework that I'm using comes from probably the most okay, famous American political scientist who worked on this federalism question. This is the great William H. Riker. Uh, there's a local government, but it is always subordinate to the central. Um, this kind of makes final decision by the central source of authority is what we call constitutional sovereignty. And there's only one in a unitary system of government. Okay. In a unitary system of government, powers can be delegated okay, by the central to the local government. A unitary system can, in fact, range from highly centralized, uh, like Singapore, which is a city-state and there's no local government. So in the context, no arrow. To highly decentralized, like Norway, wherein many powers are in fact delegated. And we could represent this with a stouter arrow. A unitary system can be more decentralized than some federalized, uh, and some centralized federal countries uh, for example, Indonesia over Malaysia. Okay? There's consensus in the scholarship that Indonesia is far more decentralized than Malaysia. And Indonesia is a unitary system. We still call it a unitary system of government okay? because although those many powers that are delegated, or many powers are delegated, they may also be rebel. And that still makes it a unitary system of government. So that can be taken back. Now, if it's a federal system of government, in certain policy areas where central government has exclusive jurisdiction, the central government is the sovereign. And it is still the one that makes final decision. And it still looks like a unitary system of government. But in certain policy areas where local government has exclusive jurisdiction, so local government becomes the sovereign okay, in the sense that it makes final decisions in certain areas. Okay, there is now a second sovereign recognized by the Constitution. Hence, another level of government also enjoys constitutional sovereignty. And it is the defining difference between a unitary and a federal system. It is very important for us to understand that it is not the level of centralization 
or decentralization that defines a unitary okay, from a center, a federal, but the constitutional protection okay, given by a federal constitution. So in this context, let's have a bar that there is no arrow. Powers cannot be revoked okay, by the central government okay, uh, to the local government because they are not delegated by the central government. Okay? Where do the powers come from? They come from the constitution. And therefore, they okay, could not be taken out. Okay? Except of course, constitutional amendment. Guaranteed by the constitution. Okay? Uh, similar to a unitary system, federalism can be highly centralized. And one of the most highly centralized right now is Venezuela. But in, we could represent it with a very thin arrow to highly decentralized, like the United States, uh, mentioned by Dr. Bintantes earlier, where we could represent a far more robust uh, bar. In certain policy areas where both governments have jurisdiction, and we call this concurrent or shared, we could represent the relationship okay, as central government okay, and local government. But you might notice that they are not okay, at the same level. It's not because that I don't that they are okay, well, okay, that's not the reason, okay. uh, but because of the concept of federal paramount C. This is a term in federalism, okay, just in case there's a conflict between the central and the local government, it is always the central that takes precedence, that takes over. When you say institutional design literature, it, it studies of the design or the design of a country's political institutions. So it's political institutions, such as the form of government, okay, already mentioned, system of government, already mentioned, electoral system, party system, legislative structure, judicial system, and constitutional bodies. Okay, how the design or the design affects or will affect, among others, the accountability, representation, popular empowerment, elite capture, and coherent policy making of the state. It is this literature that specializes in this. Uh, other terms for institutional design literature uh, would be constitutional engineering literature, constitutional design literature. These two terms are used when we're talking of the constitution. Institutional design would be for broader design of institutions. Institutional approach, or simply new institutional design. Uh, the institutional design literature counts some of the biggest names in the political science discipline, uh, including winners of the Johann Sweeter Prize in political science. Uh, think of this as our Nobel Prize. And it is, it is the Johann uh, Sweeter Prize in political science, given by the Uppsala University in Sweden. And it is given to the scholar who in the view of the foundation has made the most valuable contribution to political science. So, um, the institutional design literature represents the best minds that have studied similar institutional issues that Filipinos now face and the real experts on these issues. Okay. So we now go to the three cautionaries. Uh, the first cautionary insight is that there is no consensus on the superiority of one system of government to another. There is no consensus on the superiority of the federal to the unitary system of government. Okay? Or, uh, this just in blue because I'm not going to discuss it per se, but because the PDP Laban constitution is semi presidential, and President Duterte wants a semi presidential uh, ship okay, in the form of government as he stated in his first State of the Nation address, let me just mention this here and there, a parliamentary semi-presidential to the presidential form of government, okay? or vice versa. There's no such thing in the literature. While some scholars in the institutional design literature do argue for the superiority of a federal to a unitary system, some scholars also in the same institutional design literature deny the superiority of a federal to a unitary system. These scholars find that there is no meaningful difference 
in the performance between federal and unitary systems on a number of key indicators. Okay? For example, depending on the scholars you are reading, I'll only, I'll only mention eight, but we could have or more. Okay? Human development. Okay? This is the business class, okay? so I suppose you're familiar with human development. Economic performance, including surprisingly public finance. Income inequality. Democratic stability. Sorry, quality of your democracy, rule of law, anti-corruption, and handling multi-ethnic conflicts. Although there might be a problem here, fewer scholars can hold this view. Okay, let's do a uh, human development in this. Okay? So, because we lack time, let's just do one. Okay, so this is the HDI, Human Development Indicators, by the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. There are three indices in the Human Development Index. Okay. Um, this will involve the Life Expectancy Index, representing long and healthy life of the population. Then, the Education Index, very important, because it represents the le level of knowledge for human capital of a society, okay, consisting of expected years of schooling and mean years of schooling, and a decent standard of living through the Gini the Genai, sorry, Genai index, to create the human development <coughs> index. Uh, in 2016, our human development indicator score is 0.682, and which puts us 116 out of 188 countries. So we're not doing well. Okay? We're actually at the lower middle in our performance in terms of HDI one of the most important indices to measure human development. So, should we transit to federalism then? So, this is a provisional list that I offer in my lectures okay, based on okay, a number of okay, uh, literature, including the Forum of Federation website, okay, 27 federal states, more or less. Okay, you could think of federal states in a Okay, we have 193 countries in total in some 27 federal states. Okay, it would be Argentina, or Australia, Austria, Belgium, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Romania, Brazil, Canada, Comoros, Ethiopia, Germany, India, Iraq, Malaysia, Mexico, uh, Federated States of Micronesia, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Russia, South Africa, a little debatable if it's really federal, Spain also debate whether it's federal, Sudan, St. Kitts, Nevis, Switzerland, United Arab Emirates, United States, and Venezuela. The Philippines has a better HDI score than more than one-third of these federal countries. Okay? We're better, we have a better score than 10 countries okay, in this list. Okay? We're better than Comoros, Ethiopia, India, Iraq, Micronesia, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Africa, Sudan. Now, if we consider only federal states in the Asia Pacific, so we take out countries that are not there in Asia Pacific, the Philippines has a better HDI score than more than half of these federal countries, five out of eight countries. But if we consider only federal states in Asia Pacific that are electoral democracies, okay, as defined by Freedom House, okay, where in your an electoral democracy, if your most important political leaders are elected to competitive popular elections, only Australia okay, outperforms the Philippines in HDI school. Okay? And if you're going to be strict about Asia Pacific, and you take out Pacific, the Philippines is the best performer as an electoral democracy compared to all these countries. That's something to think about. So the diversity of federal countries is important to keep in mind when you listen to proponents of federalism in the Philippines okay, who keep on highlighting just a few well-performing federal countries. Okay, their favorite examples, Germany, Malaysia, Switzerland, the United States, Australia, while ignoring the more problematic ones identified by various literature, uh, not just federalism, but democratization literature, especially. For example, Argentina with its macroeconomic crisis right now. Brazil okay, with its crisis, okay, economic and political. Okay, Comoros, Ethiopia, 
Iraq, Mexico, okay, uh, 5,000 murder rate okay, for the year, uh, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, South Africa, even state, okay, Dr. Vivian just mentioned, okay, the Catalonia problem, okay, so it's past, the Catalonia figure right now, okay, Sudan, okay, with its civil war, and South Sudan separating from it, okay, and the most problematic case right now, Venezuela, okay, I'm okay, quite confident you're familiar with that, what's happening with Venezuela, okay, when, okay, Paul finds 30% of Venezuelans open eat only once a day, which is terrible, because resource-wise, Venezuela is the richest country in Latin America because it has oil. In one survey by, a, by three, a consortium of three universities, 70% of the population actually has lost 14 pounds in one year. They were not dieting, okay? Uh, it was because they could not eat it. And this is a business class, and I prepared this. Uh, the current inflation rate is 150,000. It is a hyperinflationary crisis. Here in this country, we have, we have a 6.9% inflation rate, and it's already a big political issue. Try 150,000, where price no longer functions as an information key. Okay. That is why okay, close to 7% of the population has already left Venezuela in four years. Okay. Close to 2.3 million to 4 million. Okay, Venezuelans have left the country to neighboring countries. It's almost unthinkable to leave your own country because of hunger. Okay, but it is happening in Venezuela, and yes, Venezuela is a federal country. Okay, second question I would say. Okay, reform, not over. The recommendation of tax scholars for democratic countries with already functioning systems or forms of government. Okay, special emphasis again on democratic countries is to reform rather than overhaul their systems or forms of government. Um, let me put the historical context on the scholarship. The revival of institutional design questions okay, is, art is actually largely linked with the most recent wave of, of democratization, where from 1974 to 1994, a period of 20 years, dramatically, about 75 plus countries transited to democracies, including one in 1986. Okay. Of course, our country, the Philippines in 1986. These institutional design questions okay, um, covered fundamental institutional choices for new democracies. Okay? They're, they're faced uh, with new institutional choices because they were transiting from a one regime to another, an authoritarian to democratic. Of course, they need to come up with a new constitution, most of them. So the most important is the form of government question. And talk about scholarship with an impact, okay, the role of one lens, okay, a Spanish-American political scientist, okay, 1992, 1990 article, The Perils of Presidentialism. Okay. This is the article and had an impact, okay, dramatic impact on political science and institutional design. Um, this argument would be picked up by Filipino parliamentary advocates by the mid-1990s. Okay. Ironically, when we have already made our choice of form of government in the 1987 constitution, and it was presidential. Okay. These new democracies Okay, in transition, have no option but to make these constitutional choices the same way we were faced okay, in 1986. And the difficulty and danger of these institutional choices are captured by the subtitle of one winner of the Johann Sweden Prize in political science, Johan Elsner, book on post-communist transitions in Eastern Europe. And this is the important work, Institutional Design in Post-Communist Societies. But the subtitle okay, is dramatic. Rebuilding the ship at sea. How could one rebuild the ship at sea? Can it be done? Okay. But you have to do it. Why? You simply have no choice. You're transiting, okay, in their case, from a okay, communist regime to a democratic one. You have to rebuild the ship. 
at C. So in this context, uh, even for many scholars arguing the superiority of parliamentary and on federal, there is no recommendation to dump existing presidential unitary systems. Um, the analogy here is Sagada versus Manila. Okay. Um, one could discuss Sagada, okay, how beautiful it is, how tranquil the place, how crisp in the air, as well as the sea, you could, uh, the river, okay, the waters, how you could commune with nature. Okay. It's very nice in Sagada. Okay. So think of that it's very nice to our federalism. But it is a separate issue if you're going to use the template of Sagada to restructure Manila. Of course, it sounds crazy. In many ways, the way that uh, some scholars have promiscuously, promiscuously okay, used the debate in okay, the federalism as far as parliamentary okay, and used it okay, as a template for the Philippines. So, may I emphasize for most people in the literature, it's just a scholarly debate. Very few okay, actually recommend that issue. Uh, overhaul. Among the reasons why strongly discouraged are the victory, okay, unnecessary. If there is no superiority, then there is no need for overhaul. Second, it is unbelievable. The tasks are too institutionally and intellectually complex for the lofty goals that the, pro that the proponents are setting. Let's start with institutional. Especially for federalism, where state governments, okay, state constitutions, state courts, state bureaucracy, etc., etc., would have to be created if you're going to shift to federalism. Okay. Um, there have been four proposed federal constitutions that have been submitted to Congress under the Duterte administration. First is Eugene Rivera and Aurelio Gonzalez Jr. Resolution of both houses, number eight, in August 2016. Now, this is the one known as, known as RBH number eight. And that's the first page. Uh, the second one is the Federalism Study Group of the PDP Laban Federalism Institute in August 2017. Um, this is the front cover of version 1.7 of their constitution. It is the one that was submitted to Congress in August 2017. They would also come up okay, also with a book whose cover was okay, shown by Dr. Villantes earlier. Okay, the Quest for a Federal Republic. Okay. Then the, okay, uh, the third is the one that President Duterte created okay, to Executive Order 10 December 2016 that was only born January 2018 okay, when the vote in okay, the lower house was passed and the Senate actually showed their opposition against it the Consultative Committee to review the 1987 Constitution that was submitted to Congress in July 2018. Uh, this is the Bayanihan Federalism. Okay? And it is, well, it is the one that was submitted okay, last July. It, it was the one that was okay, mentioned by President Duterte in his latest song. And then the fourth, this is the Arroyo et al, including two authors of that, RBH 8, uh, and I think 18 others, there are 20, 21 of them, if I'm not mistaken. This is resolution of both houses number 15, okay, in September 2018. Okay, this is the front cover of the RBH 18. Okay, so, four proposed federal constitutions so far. Okay, so you have RBH 8, okay, uh, the BDP 11 constitution, then you have the Puno Constitution. By the way, it's called Puno Constitution because the head of the commission is the former Chief Justice, Reynaldo Puno. And then okay, this is the Arroyo et al. The proposed constitution, RBH 15. Okay, um, all four illustrate how complex, problematic, elusive, mind boggling and risky the institutional design of our own needed to affect a transition from a unitary to a federal system of government in a democracy. Uh, I read I them all in my UPP. Okay, okay. 
and they're also mind-bogglingly expensive to implement. Okay. Uh, let's do the PDP London Constitution. Okay. According to the leading expert on fiscal federalism or fiscal decentralization in this country, okay, Dr. Manasan of EIDS, okay, uh, she, plus a, uh, she was the first to do the computation. Okay, and we're just doing salaries. And this does not include the judicial system. And this does not include new buildings. Okay? Uh, just salaries of governors, vice governors, senators, okay, members of judiciary. But the 40 to the note there says that I did not okay, do the computation. Salaries of state legislators, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Okay, what is the estimate? The lowest estimate is 44 billion a year. Okay? Not one time, but a year. Okay? Or 53 to 60 billion a year, okay? or 66 to 72 billion a year. So it's a, an estimate of 44 to 72 billion a year. Okay? Let's put this into context. Okay? The train law, okay? the first installment of train law, which has been politically costly for the Duterte administration, but worse, has been economically costly for the poorest of the poor. Okay, of our country because the social safety net of train one did not work okay, properly. Okay. It's just supposed to generate 92 billion pesos. Okay. So if you're going to do the low estimate of Dr. Manasan, it's already half of what we could collect in train one. If it's the high estimate, okay, it's almost three fourths of what we are going to collect. Okay. The big question always is, where on earth are we going to get that money? And if we, get, if we could get that money, why on earth are we going to spend that for this project? How about the latest one? Well, second to the latest, I mean, the Puno Constitution. Dr. Manasan estimates it as costing 55 billion a year. But interestingly, the economic managers of, the, of Duterte himself, they actually impose that Puno Constitution according to the close friend of the president, the finance secretary, this is his words, I'm not changing it, I'm not exaggerating, federalism could become a fiscal nightmare. Why? Because the spending will drive up our deficit okay, relative to the GDP by 6%. Okay? And that's going to affect our credit rating. And it's going to be held for our national debt. Okay? Then you have Okay, the Secretary General of NEDA. These are not opposition figures. These are the economic manager, managers of the current administration. The very administration that okay, formed the Consultative Committee, federalism will wreak havoc on the Philippine economy. What is the estimate of NEDA? Turns out it's even bigger than Dr. Manasan for the Puno Constitution. In the first year, the high estimate is 253 billion. Okay. The, the main discrepancy is that NEDA computes the new buildings that would be built. Okay. That's why 253. 156 to go up to 43, then to be adding something. Okay. Including the equalization fund of 85 billion. My voting, I said. Okay. So I'm not exaggerating when I say my voting. It might even be an understatement. So, in this context, the benefits are uncertain. Okay, already mentioned okay, the literature okay, is not a fan okay, of shifting to a new constitution or a new system of government. The benefits are uncertain, but the huge costs are there. Okay, let's do now intellectual. Uh, the institutional design literature, they remember its context, it said in the 1780s to the 2000s, has clearly sobered from the enthusiasm of the early 1990s on the power to get institutional design right. Um, um, if, I, if I may share to you a 2013 article in Perspectives on Politics, a leading journal of my discipline, okay, it gathers the top institutional design scholars okay, and make them reflect on what has happened in terms of institutional design. And it's only about electoral systems, one small component Okay, of institutions. We're not talking of systems of government, okay, which would be granted. Okay, and they reflect here on the limits of changing 
institutions. Okay, how their theoretical predictions okay, actually did not anticipate electoral outcomes. And also importantly, or interestingly, how politicians actually neglected their advice, cherry picking only what they liked. Okay? Because in the final analysis, it's not the scholars who change constitutions, it's politicians. Okay? So the eye should be on politicians, not on us scholars, because we only analyze. Okay? Ultimately, it's the politicians who are going to write the new constitution. Um, uh, this is a okay, business class. You might have heard of Francis Fukuyama. Okay, he's a member of my discipline, belongs to my discipline. Okay, he's a public intellectual that successfully bridged theoretical work and okay, public consumption. Um, the title is the giveaway, Development and the Limits of Institutional Design. And what's the conclusion of the great Fukuyama? Okay, uh, just reform your institutions. Okay, because theoretical predictions okay, on the strength of institutional design has been softened by the reality of politics, cultural, okay, and historical context of these societies. So, this is true even for the institutional design literature on federalism. If I may share to you that one of the leading scholars okay, on fiscal federalism okay, in political science, this is Jonathan Rodden, he teaches in Stanford University. Um, this is from the okay, uh, thick book, Oxford Handbook of Political Economy. Um, this is a section, if I may share, as decentralization and federalism spread around the world along with democratization in the 1990s, these claims of the superiority of federalism seemed increasingly anachronistic in the face of subnational debt accumulation and bailouts among large federations and evidence of corruption and inefficiency associated with decentralization programs. Furthermore, cross-national empirical studies linked federalism with macroeconomic distress okay, and corruption. And he cites two more political scientists, um, Eric Wibbles, whom you're going to encounter later, and Daniel Treisman. So these are top political scientists. And we now meet Eric Wibbles, okay, our article, uh, 2006 article, in our, in our annual review of political science, okay, our most okay, prestigious annual review. Uh, according to Eric Wibbles, same message. Okay, second, the macro experience, this is 2006, the macro experience of many decentralized nations, okay, both federal and unitary, okay, has simply fallen short of the normative literature's expectations. Decentralized finance and decision-making have been associated with poor economic performance. In Argentina, okay, um, Rimmer and Wibbles say and Tomasi, okay, Tomasi is an Argentinian. Okay, in Brazil, Samuels, aggravated redistributed conflicts and ethnic tensions in Nigeria, and several nations of Eastern Europe, that's Valerie Boots, another political scientist, and uh, an exacerbated inequality in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, the United States has an income inequality comparable to Latin America, okay? and it is a federal country. Okay. So, the Philippines Constitutional Overall Project in 2016 2018 is the height of intellectual irony, probably if you're looking from outside okay, to inside. Is it Dupree's? Meaning that in spite of the literature, we will proceed, Abastan, okay? or and or simply ignorance of the literature. Okay. Um, reform, okay. these reforms, okay, do not need constitutional regulations. Okay, so why reforms? Why reforms are recommended? Well, first of all, okay, most of all, most reforms do not need constitutional regulations. Okay, most of them need only legislation. They okay, just have to pass a law. Or if you really have to touch the constitution, okay, these are just a okay, surgical or pinpoint constitutional amendments. Okay. Uh, why, do the lit why does the literature okay, like reforms? It is more justifiable. 
Let me share to you two reform principles by a political sociologist teaching Stanford University, Larry Dyer. The first, reform only in the face of manifest laws. Okay? What does manifest mean? Manifest is, it is obvious to most people, from least the majority of the population, that there is a problem. Okay? Manifest. And because it is manifest, it is also it's already being backed up by some kind of social constituency. Meaning that people agree that there is a problem. Dr. Bilantas raised earlier the party list. Okay? If you talk party list among political scientists, among media personnel, even among politicians, there's an agreement that we have a problem with the party list. Okay? That's what we say manifest laws. Uh, we don't have that in federalism. Okay? As a sur SWS survey was shown, the latest Pulse Asia survey, not only 70% plus opposed federalism, Okay, in the, the Constitution for Federalism. But when they were asked in terms of what are the problems of the Philippines that you want the current administration okay, to actually face, only 3% said charter change. 3%. Okay. So reform only in the face of manifest laws, and reform should correct those flaws as specifically as possible. Why? Because the problem when you're trying to reform your institution is that you might overcorrect your constitution. Every reform introduces its own problem. Okay? That's why you be very careful when you're trying to reform. Uh, the way the PDP Laban sells its campaign is okay, the grand bargain, the grand package. Okay? And if you look at the book, if you look at the article, where is the scholarship? Not a single footnote, not a single enemy. Okay? And I would suppose okay, it would be very difficult for the scholar to actually raise one, to cite one, because I could not find a literature for that. Okay? So let us continue. It is less risky. Messed up reforms are more reform reformable. Okay? If there are errors in the reforms, okay? Reforms are not magic bullets. You could make it pay to commit errors. Okay? It is easier to refer to the old setup when okay? we're passing new legislation or to push it further. Where did we get it wrong? Okay? Okay? To the new setup, to new legislation or amendments. Okay? Um, for example, the literature talks about peaceful reforms that move to a more parliamentary like direction. If you are a fan of parliamentary systems, I am not, okay, but some scholars actually would recommend that, you know, if you like parliamentary system, we could have, or parliamentary reforms, we could actually have some reforms okay, that move us to that parliamentary direction. For example, party system reforms against turnkey systems. You don't need to change your constitution for that. Okay? You don't need to shift to a parliamentary reform. Okay? Or a more federal-like direction, if you're a fan, of federalism, I am not, okay, but some scholars would say, oh, we could have reforms that could okay, move you to a more federal-like direction. Okay, it's two examples, increased regional autonomy or a more robust local government. Too, okay? And these reforms involve only legislation. Okay? Um, let's discuss a more, okay, a more robust local government. Too. For example, Federalism proponents here in this country talk of the need to change the 6040, the current 6040 uh, sharing in the IRA for the national local, meaning 60% goes to the national, then 40 goes to the local. If you hear lectures okay, of federalism proponents, they have been with them, I have debated with them, they say that it's okay, very unfair. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why they change, want to change the constitution. What is the formula that they want? Okay. They want it, okay. Some people would want it to be changed to 40-60 for the local government, okay. as high as 20 for the central, then 80 for the local. Okay. What's wrong with this argument? Okay. Uh, but this could actually be simply, okay, this could be done by simply amending the local government code, the Republic Act 7160. Okay, this is 7160, the local government code. Where can we find the sharing? Okay, it's under section 284. 
the allotment of internal revenue taxes. It is one okay, just one phrase in the law on the third year and thereafter, 40%. That could be changed by simple legislation. Okay? And why? Because Article 10 of the 87 Constitution speaks of the principle of just share. While leaving it to legislation, what percentage will the just share be? The Article 10 is open-ended. It is the most underrated article of the Constitution, I tell my students. Okay? It is a brilliant article. Okay? And it is tragic that it keeps on being uh, criticized okay, by many federalism proponents. I suspect that they have not read Article 10 or they have forgotten what they have read. Uh, look at article, look at section 6. Okay. Local government units shall have a just share as determined by law in the national taxes which shall be automatically released on them. And section 6 is even far more generous than the local government code because it is not limited to the internal revenue allotment. It talks of national taxes, not just either. That could have been far more okay, comprehensive. And this goes on and on. Do what the section 5 okay, in terms of revenue and expenditure allotment. This section 5 is also open ended. Each local government unit shall have the power to create its own sources of revenues and to levy taxes, fees, and charges subject to such guidelines and limitations as the Congress might, may provide. But it does not say how. Consistent with the basic policy of local autonomy, the principle of local autonomy is the one that will guide Congress, not control, but local autonomy. Then, such taxes, fees, and charges shall, ac shall accrue exclusively to the local governments. Not even a sharing. Okay? It sounds like federalism, although it is not. Okay? And how about Section 7? Okay, if you listen again to federalism proponents about how unfair the sharing in national wealth, and that's why we have to shift to federalism, that's why we have to change the constitution. It's already there in the constitution. Okay, the sharing of national wealth. Okay, local governments shall be entitled to an equitable share in the proceeds of the utilization and development of the national wealth within their respective areas in the manner provided by law. It is not only including sharing the same with the inhabitants by way of direct benefits. Okay, we go again to Dr. Manasan, okay, um, where she discusses the PDP Latin design of fiscal federalism, and we're talking of reforms. Okay, according to her, there are four pillars of fiscal federalism. If you want to do federalism, the heart of federalism okay, is the money involved. Okay, that's fiscal federalism. What are the four pillars, according to Dr. Manasan, echoing the literature on fiscal federalism, including Jonathan Rodden, expenditure assignment, okay, who spent, what are the okay, responsibilities of the local government as well as the national government? Let us talk from the local. Revenue assignment, who gets a tax, what? What can the local government tax? Okay, Intergovernmental transfers, including equalization fund. And then subnational borrowing. Okay, which is actually, number four is actually forgotten by the federal constitutions okay, that were proposed. They forgot the value, okay, which in Argentina and Brazil have caused macroeconomic debt crisis. Okay, there's no provision, clear provision on subnational value. But the point here, these are the four pillars of fiscal federalism. Let's now do the four pillars of fiscal decentralization in the unitary system. How different are they? What's the first component? Expenditure assignment. What's the second component? Revenue assignment. What's the third component? Intergovernmental transfers, including equalization fund. Okay, that could have been done in the local government code. They did not do that. And then fourth, subnational government. What's the difference? None. Okay? Nothing that substantial. It's just the constitutional protection. Okay? So if you want to get the benefits, supposedly, of fiscal federalism, you don't have to change the constitution. We don't even have to okay, go to federalism. You don't have the same component. What is the difference? The constitutional protection that is given 
But if we notice in Article 10, our decentralization is constitutionally mandated. But it is a constitutionally mandated decentralization. Okay? That's why, for example, one framer of the Constitution, the, uh, Commissioner Christian Monsot says, we're actually a hybrid system. We're in between uh, a unitary and a federal one. Why? Because our decentralization is not okay. uh, This is Republic Act number 7160. Okay. In terms of review, okay. uh, according to the local government code, and it is a very good code, okay. very thick code, okay. Um, okay. Uh, the father of this uh, Republic Act is seen okay. as father as father, as Senator Nelipin Muter. At least once every five years, there's a mandatory review okay, of the local government code. Why is a review mandated? So that we will know if it is working. And uh, what institution is mandated to do that? It's the Congress. It's the very okay, Congress that would actually change the Constitution. The okay, Congress, okay, every five years. When was it passed? October 1991. How many mandatory reviews have we done since 1991? Not a single one. Congress has not done even a single review. It could not even review the local government. So now it wants to change the new constitution. Without the review, how would we know? Okay? where we are weak, an official interpretation. Yes, reviews have been done by scholars, including Dr. Williams. Okay. Yes, the last review was done in 2014 fought by the DILG, funded by the Asian Development Bank. But that's not official, it's only about fiscal. And the recommendations were the, are the same being mentioned by this lecture. Okay. We could do equalization fund by simply tweaking certain sections, we could increase this, Okay, it's shared by simply tweaking certain sections. So, okay, it's overhaul. Very different from mess up constitutional revisions involving system or form of government, especially for the shift to federalism. Okay. Why? Because when we talk of federalism, remember it's about constitutional protection. There is a concept in federalism of constitutional entrenchment wherein you have to get the, the agreement of these constituent states in order to change its federal character. That's why it's very hard okay, to return to unitarian. Okay. Uh, no federal country ever negotiated under democratic conditions has ever returned to unitarian. What, the, what does this mean? If we make a grand mistake in our transition, there is no turning okay. If you write down okay, a provision in the Constitution, and it turns out it's so messed up, you need to change the Constitution. Okay. Some people say, let us constitutionalize this thing, okay, for that federalism proponent. But they don't tell you the negative aspect of it. If you make a mistake, how do you correct it? Okay. Uh, in my, I teach a federalism class, my students could understand this by saying, once I have given you the grade, do you think that it's a one? Do you think that you're going to return to Okay. I like especially if you're in another class, a new class. Okay. I like. If you ask me, it's impossible. Okay, so let's now do third questionnaire insight. Uh, probably the most important. Institutional design is political design. Okay. Meaning that it is always political. Okay. According to Adam Sworsky and others, Adam Sworsky uh, is another winner of the Johan Sutter Prize, one of the biggest names in political science, period, not just institutional design. Okay. In the truly monumental book okay, of top social scientists okay, during that, those, that wave of democratization, sustainable democracy, I highly recommend it because I think we are economists there okay, for the business students here, sustainable democracy. Okay. There are no optimal democratic institutions. It is a fool's errand to look for the superior institution. There are no optimal democratic institutions. Okay. Okay. So let us imagine these optimal democratic institutions as letter B. According to Sborsky, 
can have no such thing. Okay? But even if there were optimal democratic institutions, okay, so that's the purpose of the day. Okay, so let's okay, divide the D. Okay. And this is okay, the most important argument. The distributive impact of institutional design means opposing political forces will most likely not be spent. The question when you change institution okay, is not okay, which is superior. The question is who will benefit. Okay? This is the political economy question. And this is where my discipline actually shines. According to the literature, okay, so if you think of A, where we are now, B is your okay, optimal democratic state, which does not even exist. Okay? You'll never get there. It's always B1. This is the assumption of the institutional design literature that I'm using. It could be B2, it could be B3, B4, B5, ad infinitum. But I don't have space anymore, so let us stop. Okay? This would be the opposing political voices. Okay? Uh, the most important actors are those who will write the constitution. Not the ones who lecture about them, not the ones who write about them, not the ones who recommend about them, but the politicians who are going to write the constitution. That's where the eye should be. And each institutional design outcome, for the most part, reflects the balance of power. And this is what we call the political economy of institutional design, or, or if we're talking of the constitution, constitutional engineering. Okay, the politics behind constitutional engineering. Okay, so we now focus on Duterte, the okay, political economy of the federalism project in the Philippines under Duterte, and we offer a framework. And we apply the constitution, the already proposed constitution. Okay, U is uh, unitary. F is federal, okay? and then the blue is parliamentary semi-presidential. Then the question is, how do we reach here? And this is the, okay, so how do we reach F? And this is the political economy question. Uh, the current preferred vote is of the Philippine president, the house as a house, the Senate president, whether it was uh, Clinton or now Tito Soto, and some senators okay, would be the constituent essentially. Okay? Uh, we're in three fourths, we need three fourths vote of all members of the Senate and the lower house voting separately to change the constitution. Okay? And it has been done on January 16th in the lower house, they passed House Concurrent Resolution number nine, which we will discuss later. HCR number nine. Interesting about the HCR number nine, it pretends to have a constitution. Because it calls that let us shift the federal constitution, but it's just a okay, mimeograph and a few pages. Okay, not more than I think 20 pages. And it's okay, just the salient point of its proposed constitution. They want to change the constitution, but the constitution wasn't even there on January 16, 2018. But what they want, they okay, okay, will be there. Okay. Assuming that the Duterte administration could get the three parts vote. Okay, meaning 18 out of 24 in the Senate. Uh, this is nearly impossible. Okay? I would want to write impossible, but okay, people say do not be definitive, so let's just be nearly impossible. Okay? 18 out of 24. Okay? Uh, at least five senators will not vote okay, for, for charter change no matter what. Okay? The sixth one is in prison, okay? and she will never vote okay, for this. She's after okay, campaigning against it. Then recto, okay, just in saying let's do decentralization, not federalism. You only need seven senators to oppose okay, the charter change in order to okay, uh, torpedo it. We have one of the highest okay, supermajority vote in order to change the constitution. Okay? Dina says that she is in favor of, look, of just reforming. Okay? Even Lapson has said that he is not in favor of okay, federalism. And of all people, even the the Gordon says that okay, he will most likely not support charter change. Okay, this was at the start of the year. And I think so is after that now. This is July 16, 2018, when it says that only four senators uh, so far support 
of federalism. I think this is an accurate count. I'll explain later why. Ah, thanks, I have to explain now. Uh, the key reason for the opposition of the nationally elected Senate is the proposal for its replacement by a regional Senate. Okay? The national Senate would be replaced by a regionally elected Senate. Dr. Villan has already uh, discussed one version of it, okay, the Bayanian Constitution, okay, where each region will get two senators. Okay? Uh, the regional Senate is the most important shared institution of federalism. Of the 27 federalism, federal countries that I listed, only three countries are unicameral. Okay? This would be Venezuela, um, St. Kitts and this, and United Arab Emirates. All else are bicameral. Okay? Because it is where the states are represented in the legislature. That's why our Senate, which is unique, if you're, just in case you're not familiar, we have a unique Senate because it's nationally elected. Okay? And that's what makes it a very powerful institution. Okay? Because it has a national constituency, it has a national mandate, and it's no accident that some of our presidents came from the Senate. Okay? Um, if you look at uh, RBHA, uh, then PDP Laban, then HCR 9, and then the Bayanian Constitution, all of them proposed a okay, regionally elected Senate. No way would the Senate actually commit institutional harafari. Okay? Duterte is just good for six years. The Senators, because the way we uh, uh, design our term limits for the Senators, okay, they are allowed two consecutive terms, 12 years, they only sit for three years, then they return. If it's going to be a regional senate, uh, Dr. Villan just mentioned that most of these senators are NCR, uh, so in fact, most of them are NCR. I think 14 or 15 of them NCR. They, they do not have regional nor national bases, many of them. And the prestige of actually having only 24 compared to 66 or 72 or 88, okay, that's going to be a big number. Except Arroyos et al's resolution of both houses number 15, okay, which uh, recommends the National Senate. Uh, this is the first page again of RBA 15. This is the exception that proves the rule um, to appease the Senate. Okay? Because the Senate has already said we will not, okay, we're not interested. RBA 15 came out to actually court the Senate by offering the legislative department the Senate as nationally elected, which does not make any sense because how would the regional governments be represented in the legislature? Suddenly they don't have representation. It's a federalism without a head. Okay, and 223, 297, that's the vote that you need in the lower house, that's sure vote because of the nature of your lower house. Okay? They're district, they're elected at the level of district, they have very parochial interests, their concerns is, okay, is only their district. All the president has to do is to promise that no one runs against them in the next election. Boy, okay, that's federalism okay, to their use. So in this context, because it's the Congress, just two comments okay, uh, to share. First of all, the very low level of institutionalization of political parties. Okay? The Philippine political party system is notorious for this. Okay? And one of the most crucial indicators, very dramatic, is party switching. Okay? What could be worse okay, as a reflection of the institutionalization of political party if, okay, if the candidate for president, if your party's candidate for president loses, you switch to the winning candidate. Okay? Can you imagine the Democratic Party okay, just because Hillary Clinton lost they become Republicans. Okay? There is no, probably no more dramatic indicator okay, or no level than abandon your own party. Okay? Let's do the current 17th Congress, the one that will become the contest. The election result for the House of Representatives, okay? the PDP Laban only had three out of 297 representatives who won in the 2016 election. How many LP? LP had 116 members, they okay, winning. But because of the post-election party switching and realignment in, in the middle of 2016, the PDP Laban membership and allies swelled to a whopping supermajority of 260 plus. 
from 3 to 260. Okay, that's hyperinflationary okay, by any means. 260 plus, okay, counting down to 28 as of May 2017. Okay, uh, very this year, 2023, uh, I don't know now, if there are still empty members, but there are still empty members, okay, but lower. And then the official minority, 20 plus, but they're also the majority's minority. We're, stuck, we're talking of the early, but the middle 2016. Uh, the majority, okay, the minority is actually pro-majority, okay, as proof, the deputy minority leader at that time was Harry Roque, and Harry Roque will be, okay, uh, recruited by President Duterte as his own spokesperson. The real minority at that time dwindled down to seven members. Okay. Uh, just three comments. Higher level of payoffs to more to move the legislative agenda of executive. Uh, this is through pork barrel by any other name. Okay. Uh, CDF, EDAP, DAP, okay, to try to support. More incoherent policy making. I'm sorry, more coherent lawmaking as more policy side payments are made with more players representing particular state interests and more unstable political support for the president, especially when its popularity goes down. Okay, this will be the effect of low institutionalization of political parties. Okay? And then the second one would be the high level of barrier to energy. And uh, one of the most crucial indicators, they already mentioned by Dr. Dilantes, okay, always mentioned okay, in the discussion is political dynasty. Uh, not aware of any scholarly study yet on the 16th Congress and the current 17th Congress, but there are at least two in the House of Representatives of the 15th Congress, 2010-2013. Okay, the first one is from your very own Ateneo. Okay, this would be a Ron Mendoza Ross IFL's 2012 study, okay, Inequality and Democracy, Insights from Empirical Analysis of Political Dynasties in the 15th Congress, Okay, where it shows that 70% of members belong to a political dynasty. Okay, by political dynasty, okay, they define it as having kinship ties for at least one legislator in the 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th Congress, or at least one local government division elected in 2001, 4, 7, 27. This is a dynasty three times. Okay, always mention in uh, media. Okay. And then this is the Okay, the other one is by my own colleague in the department, Dr. Emario Rivera, 2011, uh, in his work in search of credible elections and parties that he been part of, where 34 out of 77 provinces, at that time only 77 provinces, or 44% of the same political family winning the governorship and at least one congressional okay, uh, This is his chart. Okay? I usually pause to allow the audience to read, but uh, okay. Have that much time to just okay, check out your problems. Okay. This will be the chart of the. Okay, I could slow down for 30 seconds. Okay, some provinces even have senators here. Okay, the people coming from the Okay, so I have to move. Okay, okay uh, what's the implication of political dynasties? Uh, Self perpetuating politics by nature of clan replication. Okay, fathers beget son, son beget okay, their own sons, okay, it's a perpetration. Okay, that is why, according to Ron Mendoza, the, okay, the phenomenon okay, since 87 is the okay, father and father dynasties. Okay, more powerful and powerful dynasties. Then, highly clientelistic patronage based because familial clan interests take precedence over any national interest. When interest, okay, national and clan interests collide, you know very well what would take president fix the plan. <coughs> and then the third thing, from a political science view, okay, probably the most pernicious, it replaces political parties. Prevents party institutionalization as dynasties act as surrogates of political parties. They become the political parties of the okay, Philippine parties. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, or just more 10 more slides. One as members who are winners of the old unitary presidential setup. Let us use two uh, top political scientists for this framework. Okay, Stefan Hager and Robert Robert R. Kaufman. Um, we now know, okay, using our discussion of Congress, that the CONAS members, especially the lower house, overwhelmingly for non-institutionalized and dynastic interests. Now, 
compromise, according to the two scholars, both compromises with groups that have benefited from existing institutional arrangements, okay, would make sure that you're not going to get an F, okay, you're going to get F1, okay, or PST1. This would be the institutional design outcome that reflects the balance of power. But this balance of power, because we know there's a supermajority there in Congress, we could expect, using this framework, that the distributed swing could be more than okay? It's going to swing further. Okay? And it's going to be further okay, than F1. It's going to be F2, okay? or PST2. Okay? Now, because, and again, uh, Hoffman and others, because of the sheer multiplicity of features involved in changing the system and form of government, um, the distributed swing would even be further at FP, okay? ESP. And according to the two scholars, okay, we could be faced by hybrid outcomes that leave lines of accountability unclear and combine the worst of both worlds. Okay? If we have this and it's constitutionalized, then there's no kind of back okay, from the 87, okay, from the new constitution. This F3, okay, I call it in my class, institutional Frankenstein assignment outcomes. You do not know what we have created. It's neither federal, neither okay, military, but the effects are very clear. Okay. Uh, this now puts us to the institutional indigeneity question. There are a number of business students here. Institutional indigeneity, okay, which is what explains institutional choices. Okay, where we consider institutions as actually the dependent variable Okay, and we now try to explain why we come up with the design of this, this institution. Institutional endogeneity is the in thing now in institutional design. Because as I said, the messed up reforms, okay, why did they uh, choose the performance? I mean, those choices and the performance that happened. And among the most important factors are the existing vested interests. Who benefit? And here is the contest members. The very people who benefited from the unitary system are the ones going to lead the change to federalism. In this context, that is why there is a premium on democratic regime transitions in the literature. Why? Because there is, a, there is an assumption of some kind of displacement of the vested interests of the old order. I mean that precisely you have a transition, okay, then you assume that okay, these political elites are, have been somewhat displaced okay, and there has been some displacement of vested interests. Okay. So existing vested interests and in this context upon us members. Okay. According to Adam Sworsky, this is the worst case scenario of constitution making okay, that you could have. Uh, this is the truly classic work, Democracy and Market, published in 1989. Um, according to the scholar, when the relation of forces is known and uneven, the institutions are custom made for a particular person, party, or alliance. And we already have the House Concurrent Resolution number nine to prove this. Okay? That this person is going to be the okay? Okay? Look at House Concurrent Resolution number nine, passed in, uh, on January 16, 2018. There's no constitution, but there are salient features. Let us focus on what happens to uh, President Duterte. Okay, let's run this fast because I don't have that much time. The incumbent president shall exercise all the powers and functions of the head of state and head of government. He will be president and prime minister under this federal constitution until the election of the next president and prime minister in May 2022. He shall appoint the new cabinet from among the members of parliament. He shall have supervision and direction over the interim prime minister and cabinet. And assuming we could elect one. And he will be allowed to run in 2022. The first regular elections for the president of the Federal Republic of the Philippines shall be held on the second Monday of May 2022. He shall be elected by direct vote of the people for 25 years. Yes, okay, quasi revolutionary powers, and then he's allowed to run in 2022. That's why I've been telling you, okay, read okay, the works of politicians, not so much the work of scholars, because the action, that's where the action will be. Okay. Party, okay, the PDP level at that time, and then alliance, this is your supermajority. 
Again, let us look at ACR number 9. The next election is 2022. Okay, what does it say? Following the adoption of this constitution, the present Congress shall be dissolved. Wow, it's what a self act of Harapiri. The Senate and the House of Representatives shall be replaced by an interim parliament that shall exist immediately and shall continue until the members of the regular parliament shall be elected and assumed office. You would think, wow, okay, self sacrifice. What's the catch? The next paragraph. The members of the interim parliament shall be the incumbent members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Okay, all members of the Senate and the members of the House shall be members of the interim parliament and not only them, even some members of okay, Duterte's cabinet will also be members of the parliament. Okay, uh, bringing to pressure the anticipation of others. Okay, answer. Okay, you want answer here on ways of constitution making, constitution ought to be written by specially convened assemblies, never by uh, not by bodies that also serve as ordinary legislators. Okay, why to reduce the scope for institutional interest? Of course, they're going to protect their interest. If you talk to senators and congressmen, okay, they don't understand federalism, but they understand where their interests lie. Okay. okay, so this is FP, SP3, the political economy of the federalism project in the Philippines under Duterte. This is my last slide. Okay. The analogy now is the same in a driver with brand new vehicle from Manila to Sagrada. Okay, the analogy here is that okay, you, have, you bought a new vehicle, okay, your old vehicle, you had a driver who kept on crashing your vehicle because he was not maintaining it. In fact, he was even okay, uh, stealing the gasoline if you're not looking. Okay, he uses it somewhere else. Now you buy a new vehicle thinking that okay, with a new vehicle, Okay, he could actually bring me safely, not only in Manila, or drive me in Manila, but he could bring me up to Sagada. Okay, why? He has a new way. Okay. Uh, I have other cautionary insights today. If you okay, if you're mindlessly surfing, you might want to check my YouTube page where I discuss the other cautionary insights. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity.